This is the Kratom Science Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Gallagher, blog and social media writer for KratomScience.com, your source for all things Kratom. My guest is Dr. Mark Swagger from the University of Rochester Medical Center, Department of Psychiatry. Dr. Swagger is a social scientist and psychologist who studies substance use. He has co-authored multiple studies on the individual and public health effects of the use of Kratom. So okay. you're up at yeah, uh, University of Rochester? That's right. I'm an associate professor in the uh, psychiatry department. And uh, my first question is, uh, did your interest in the fall in Marky e. Smith lead you to study substance use? <laughs> Well, he certainly studied substance use from yes, an experiential he did. Uh, standpoint. He was he was much more into uh, speed and alcohol. Yeah, uh, yeah, and, and so no, but but um, I, I would bet that um, a number of different substances um, do contribute to many fall fans' enjoyment of the band. Yeah, uh, so. <laughs> that's great. Um, but actually, seriously, what led you to? Uh, choose clinical psychologist is that the right term yeah i guess i'm a clinical psychologist that is yeah. true uh I'm, I'm more of a social scientist now um i'm kind of expanding my work um to do research on um therapeutic and harmful use of, of substances mm-hmm. um and i kind of got into kratom by accident um i had i had been looking uh i don't know if you know the arrowwood dot org site yes um, which is a wonder yeah okay it's a wonderful site for um uh fairly objective uh information on substances and substance use experiences and i ran across kratom and i was looking at some of the uh experience reports so people use um substances and send in their uh, description of their experiences and i realized that there hadn't been a lot of work done on Kratom in the West, or really, there hadn't been a lot of science done on it anywhere, um, and that people were using it and reporting positive results for uh, for pain. Mm-hmm. And so that I became more interested in that, uh, being a substance use researcher, and um, was able to um, work with the Arrowwoods, Earth and Fire Arrowwood, to, um, to publish a paper on those experiences and we sort of distilled them uh, into their themes and realized that people were really using Kratom for uh, a number of different reasons, a sense of well-being or um, relaxation. Um, it, it People were reporting that it made them more sociable, which is interesting for, uh, for something that other people are reporting um, has an opioid-like effect. And so... Uh, it just turned out to be a really interesting plant. And it was right after we published that paper on people's experiences with Kratom that the DEA indicated their intent to schedule it. So oh. that's when uh, everything became interesting. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, in the Journal of Psychoactive Sub- Substances, right? Experiences of Kratom yeah, Users. Yeah, Journal of Psychoactive Substances. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, because I, I mean, I remember reading Arrowwood a long time ago. When you when you went to do that study, did you, how did you, I guess, process all that information, and how did you, what was, like, your methodology and for, for just yeah. doing user reports? Because I'm kind of doing the same thing on our website. We have, like, thousands of comments, but they're, like, all over the place. It's not in one forum, and I'm kind of right. getting all the experience comments, so I'm going to put them in a database and... Just, you know, look but, and yeah, see what we not, have there. Not super easy to distill that. And it's, you know, it's qualitative research um, for the most part. So we um, we took, um, I guess we had close to 200 reports that, uh, that um, and then we eliminated ones from multiple, from the same user mm-hmm. so that we didn't do any doubling um, and didn't have any redundancy and we excluded some because we couldn't really understand what they were getting at or so you'll run into things like that. Um, but what we wound up with was 161, um, independent reports of experiences with Kratom. And so at that point we, uh, um, began to look for themes in the, in the reports. Um, and we had 
sort of an algorithm that we worked through, but it, it became pretty easy because we were seeing the same things over and over and over again. Um, we were seeing people using it for pain and reporting pain relief or using it for uh, relaxation and reporting that it worked for that. Um, and then, you know, we were seeing themes on the negative side, too. We were seeing that, um, you know, the, by far the most um, troubling negative side effect was nausea. Um, and some people had, had vomiting, things like alternating chills and sweats and dizziness. Um, mm -hmm. So. Uh, just basically breaking it down into themes and then having somebody go through it um, again with our uh, algorithm to see if they came up with the same same sorts of themes to uh, provide a little bit of a reliability check on it. Mm -hmm. And so that's it's not particularly rigorous science, but it does provide some um, standardization and control um, that's necessary. And and there's been there have been better surveys done since then. There was a, a really good one by Jack Hanningfield's team. I think Coe was the first author um, that was published in Drug and Alcohol Dependence. And um, they, were, they did a survey of uh, thousands of Kratom users. They found um, that people were using it primarily for pain, uh, but also for um, things like anxiety, uh, depression, and post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, and that, that is what we found in a previous paper. We, uh, Zach Walsh and I did a uh, systematic review of all the studies we could find on kratom use and mental health um, and published that in Drug and Alcohol Dependence. And there were only, uh, this was 2018, so there were only um, 13 uh, studies of adequate rigor that, that we included in that review. But we found uh, the same thing. Uh, and it's interesting that really the surveys that have been done thus far in the West really do converge to say that um, people are using Kratom for pain and to get off of opioids and other uh, drugs that they don't want to be on. And they're reporting positive effects. They're reporting that they're getting off of opioids. They're reporting pain relief. Um, they're reporting relief of anxiety uh, and depression. And then um, you know, there's a certain group of people that like to use Kratom at lower doses because um, there's sort of a... Um, different effect. It's more stimulating at lower doses. Yeah. And so people are also using it for energy and focus, um, which is consistent with traditional uses uh, in the East. Workers will use it to um, to focus on their work and to get through some you know long work days. And, and so really, there's a very clear picture that has emerged across these studies, um, East and West, of what the the range of experiences with Kratom looks like. I wonder if it's like a better sample when you go into Southeast Asia because they're all getting it off the trees there, and here you don't know if it's uh, adulterated. Is that... Yeah, there, there are pros and cons, I guess. Um, so generalizing from what people are getting there to what we would get here is kind of tough, like hmm. you said. Yeah. Um, we, we might have... Now, that being said, there haven't been a lot of adulterated Kratom products when they look at this, um, but you never know. And there have been some, uh, and, and some cases of Kratom combined with things that have been deadly. So it's different uh, across cultures in that way. And it's, also tr it's also difficult to get dosage uh, when you're looking at um, you know, people, people just using it traditionally. You know, I don't want to be, um, I don't want to neglect the, the part of it where uh, there is some addictive potential with Kratom. Mm -hmm. um, it seems um, quite mild relative to uh, opioids, but um, it does exist. And some people who use um, high doses, say higher than five grams uh, a day for a, you know weeks, uh, do run the risk of having uh, withdrawal symptoms if they stop. And a lot of the withdrawals, I, I, I feel like like the people I talk to who say they used to be uh, heroin addicts, and and I've interviewed a couple for this podcast, and they, and I asked them, you know, are kratom withdraw, and then and now they use kratom every day, and I say are kratom withdrawals anything like opiate withdrawals, and they just kind of laugh and say, yeah, maybe I get a headache for a couple days. Is do you find that that withdrawals are milder even for people who might have a habit of using a lot of kratom 
Oh yeah, um, it's a much more forgiving uh, plant than uh, than the opioids are. Um, they're the opioid withdrawal symptoms tend to be pretty severe, and yeah. um, kratom mimics some of those symptoms, but it it doesn't tend to last as long, and it doesn't tend to be as severe. So people are not um, on the floor, um, throwing up and, uh, unable to, to do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, you know, I don't want to minimize the yeah. withdrawal potential because if people are out there thinking they can use it and it's risk-free, um, well, that's probably not true. I mean, and for most people, um, they don't wind up having withdrawal symptoms when they stop using it, mm-hmm. but, uh, there are some people who get into some trouble with it. The, the these surveys are are uh, the the one thing you did was International Journal of Drugs Policy. It was uh, the challenge of balance, balancing therapeutic potential with public safety, and in yeah. that it talked about real world data, real world evidence, and the FDA has even said in their own statements that this is uh, a consideration when people are making healthcare choices. And then everything. Every time I see a study, it says, "Well, we do need human clinical trials." So, what is it going to take for there to go from you know, kind of the collected evidence of you know user reports to human clim- clinical trials? Um, so that's a good question. As a social scientist, I mainly study people who are using it already, and mm-hmm. uh, but I do think that there are some um, there's some science that's being funded at the University of Florida. Um, mm-hmm that is moving in that direction. I'm not sure that it's human clinical trials yet, um, but it is It is looking from a more basic science perspective at the potential of Kratom to move through um, the usual process that drugs do in the United States. Now, that this is, this is a difficult thing because um, so normally drugs will go through uh, early phase trials where it's mostly about safety and uh, preliminary indications of efficacy, and um, then they'll move on to larger trials, and then if the data look good, you know, eventually FDA approval happens, the drug is marketed, et cetera. Um, Mm -hmm. And, of course, that happened with uh, the drugs they're using for medication-assisted therapy, like buprenorphine, Mm -hmm. um, that people use to get off of opioids. What has happened, though, with Kratom is quite different. People in the West uh, gained access to Kratom, especially as the Internet, um, you know, the advent of the Internet certainly aided that, um, and began to use it, word of mouth uh, spread, and they began to use it to ease opioid withdrawals and to um, get off of opioids, uh, as well as other drugs that they didn't want to be using. I've seen quite a few reports of people getting off of SSRIs using Kratom and which have their own withdrawal sy- syndrome. So basically, by the time the DEA got around to saying, hey, we should, um, we should make this illegal, uh, millions of Americans were already using it. And so mm-hmm. you've got a situation where clinical trials are not, it's a little late. There are now, you know, I don't know what the latest estimates are, um, but it, it was over 10 million Americans are using Kratom. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're using it, Uh, by and large, uh, overwhelmingly to positive uh, effect with uh, little real evidence of adverse effects, Mm -hmm. despite what uh, what some of the some of the media reports have suggested and what the FDA has come out with. That's that's not particularly good science. And so given that we have this information that all these people are using Kratom, most of them to good effect, uh, what what would it do now? to remove that from the market? What would it do to make that, uh, to ban Kratom and um, take that away from those people until the clinical trials can be completed? Uh, a, a number of us, Jack Hanningfield, Oliver Grunman, and myself, um, we, we argue that um, because, uh, because of the situation with uh, opioids and um, what addiction is like, taking, those, taking Kratom away now um, would be cruel, and it would lead to people going back onto opioids, and a certain percent of those people would overdose and die. Yeah. And so the the main the main thing with kratom is that there's uh, little to no respiratory depression, so people are not 
overdosing on kratom and dying in in large numbers if it, i i'm not convinced there's been one i haven't found good data to indicate that and indeed in in the east uh in malaysia where you know kratom has been used for at least a century um nobody's talking about people dying from it so yeah uh there, there's a lot of talk about the risks of kratom uh, that's been overblown um and uh, it, it's not like it's not harmful if you take it away from people at this point. Do you think there's a part of like the re drug rehabilitation center industry that that has a stake in drugs being illegal because they get court ordered patients? I might be getting too far in the woods, and not, you know I don't want you to speak to. The, yeah, I. Yeah, I think that's always possible. I have not seen that. Um, so I, you know, I do a fair amount of work with uh, people who are um, running recovery centers, and um, I haven't seen it. Um, I think I, uh, you know, certainly kratom is akin to medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorders, including methadone and bu bu uh, buprenorphine. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, w you know, without going too far into people's motives. Um, yeah. I I think it's just a a lack of education. Yeah. There may be some people at the top who are who are saying, well, we want you know we want the money that's going to be associated with kratom when we can monetize it. Um, I think that's going on. Yeah. But uh, as far as you know, recovery systems, I don't think they quite understand kratom yet. Yeah. Um, and yeah. it's just a matter of more education. Uh, yeah, because I talked to a guy who was like a big time opiate addict, and he did it. He did like an inpatient detox for thirty days, and then he got out, and he just started using kratom. And he said, "Well, they'll kick me out if I want to go back in and and uh, do like an outpatient thing." So, I I, I imagine oh, yeah. it would be like just the ignorance of it. I think that's true, and I think there are more forward thinking places that won't yeah. kick you out. I mean, it does happen, and it's not right. Yeah. Um, even, you know, even using, even relapsing on heroin, um, yeah, that, that's going to happen a lot of times before somebody recovers, should they be kicked out of treatment? Um, so I don't, I don't see the logic to that a lot of the time, but, uh, for the most part, I think it comes down to just Kratom has not been well understood. Um, yeah. and, and we're working on that, but it's going to take some time. So Kratom is called an opioid by the FDA, do you do you agree with the use of that term as applied to kratom? Well, it's it's really difficult. Um, you know, it's a partial opioid agonist, so it does act on opioid receptors. Mm -hmm. It's got other things um, going on though that we don't we don't really know about. We don't quite know the mechanisms, which is common with pharmaceuticals and plants. Um, I don't know if I disagree with that term, but it's certainly not a classical opioid. It's uh, it's it, I've heard the term atypical opioid, and um, maybe I agree with that. I think the problem with labeling it an opioid is that people have an idea of an opioid crisis uh, that's going on now. We certainly have an overdose crisis, yeah. and um, labeling it an opioid lumps it in with the uh, – medications and illicit uh, drugs that people are overdosing on yeah, and yeah. really obscures clarity. It, it, it doesn't, it doesn't do anything to clarify the situation. It makes it more messy. Yeah. So it's important to distinguish an atypical opioid like Kratom that does not cause respiratory depression from the drugs that people are, um, are dying from. Public perceptions toward Kratom in Malaysia was a journal of psychoactive drugs study that you were you were on um yeah. it seems the uh, it seems like the per perception difference between users and non-users are kind of the same as they are here with maybe like marijuana especially like 20 30 40 years ago um are do you find that like the negative perception and you were talking about how opioids everybody's going to lump it in and it kind of perception kind of leads to drug policy um, which yeah. and it's important is um, are the negative views caused like kratom's prohibited in Malaysia, but are the are negative views caused by the prohibition? Do you think? Uh, here or there? Or, in or, well, in, in Malaysia, general? and I guess in general. I think it. I think in general, uh, people tend to tend to just believe what they hear. 
So if they, if something's illegal, uh, they make the leap to well, it mu there must be a good reason for that. Um, in in Malaysia, you know, I don't think kratom is viewed as negatively as as cannabis is. It's sort of a matter of if the public is convinced that something is a scourge and is going to to lead to death then it's very easy to promote a certain drug policy that may benefit pharmaceutical companies um, and, and may lead to more sales of other drugs. Um, and so we don't know what all the, the goals are there with some of these policies. Mm -hmm. I just pay attention to the point where, you know, what's the public health potential of this? It looks like the public health potential is vast with a uh, plant that people are able to get and use, and um, they are reporting that it's decreasing, uh, you know, all kinds of negative things, depression and anxiety and uh, heroin use. Public perceptions of, a, of, a certain, of any specific drug are really fed by a lot of things that, don't, that aren't grounded in reality. And you can see that, obviously, with the, the policy on cannabis and psychedelics. Um, in the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, it's becoming very clear that cannabis and psychedelics can be helpful. Uh, yeah. And in the case of psychedelics, maybe um, one of the more potent psychiatric treatments available. But uh, for years and years, and it's still happening, people were getting locked up. Uh, and, you know, here in New York State, people are still getting locked up for having cannabis. So, uh it, it's it's really it's a it's sort of a political thing and i try to stick to the public health part of it to that i mean a lot of americans are kind of forced into self-treatment um because they can't either can't afford health insurance or they can't afford medication or something or are there a lot of doctors yeah. that take this or even doctors psychologists that take this into consideration like somebody somebody might be helped by cannabis or a kratom even where it's illegal are there a lot of doctors that take that into consideration or or, or do most have to kind of follow the fda guidelines and whatnot there are more and more um yeah. it's that, that you, that's a really good point um one of the you mentioned that people can self-treat with this yeah. and um sometimes doctors look at that as a negative thing and it, it depends but uh, there are a lot of people who are benefiting from this who would never go into a hospital or a, you know, a doctor's office and get a prescription for something. Um, and and right because of uh, healthcare costs or uh, whatever reasons, the, hmm. the medical system is not for everybody. Um, <laughs> we'd we'd like to think it is. We'd like to make it for everybody, but it's not at this point. And so those people who won't do that or can't do that. It's important that they have access to um, reasonably safe uh, plants like Kratom. As far as the doctors that understand its potential, I think it's growing. Um, I think it, it's a matter of education because we have a system that splits things into good drugs and bad drugs. Mm -hmm. And um, it's much more complicated than that. And because Kratom does have some potential for uh, tolerance and withdrawal, um, doctors are wary of it at the outset. But as more papers are published and more uh, doctors are educated on the potential benefits of Kratom and, and um, what the risks are and that they're not the, the serious adverse events, I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really a low number. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I, I think that it's going to, it's moving in the right direction at this point, and that there are some doctors who will listen to patients and their experiences that value that first, and most of all, they're out there. Not a lot of doctors have heard of it, I imagine. And then if you do look it up, um, there's so much misinformation on the uh, on the internet about yeah. Kratom that um, it's not helpful. I can see why people avoid talking about it. Uh, yeah. The best situation is if you can find a doctor who will listen to you and understand why you're using it and what it's doing for you and and really do some research that's that's great when that happens um it's just hard because uh doctors are not trained um on plants like kratom there was a study that came out 
called Kratom Use and Toxicities in the United States. You were on a uh, critique of that. It was uh, this guy, Eagleston. And um, it, yeah, they, took, that. they took the Poison Control Center calls. I mean, I once called a Poison Control Center because I got bit by a brown spider, and I thought it was a recluse. Yeah. And the guy was like, the guy already <laughs> knew that it wasn't because he gets so many calls like that. So uh. <laughs> I guess the question is, is it, is it good to rely on poison control center calls to make an assessment of how dangerous kratom is? No, <laughs> uh, it's absolutely not. <laughs> I mean, that's why we. I think yeah, I already um, knew the answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know you were setting me up, and I appreciate it. Um, no, uh, the the uh, we had a couple of those studies in my you know when when Zach Walsh and I published the uh, kratom use and mental health review, we did include a couple of poison control center studies just to round out the information. But anytime you look at a study like that, there are numerous biases that are not controlled for. And you, you pointed it out perfectly. Mm-hmm. Um, if somebody takes a plant and then, so, you know, uh, and then has any kind of reaction and doesn't know much about that plant, maybe they took it intentionally or unintentionally, um, they might call a poison control center. And they might report specific symptoms. And those symptoms may or may not have anything to do with what they took. And what they took may or may not have been Kratom. It's just a, it's a, it's a messy way to collect data. Um, it's useful for monitoring general trends. But when you try to, try to make causal connections, you can't. And, and so when um, scientists publish papers like that where they, look at uh, poison control center studies or case studies um, and they overinterpret. They go too far and say, uh, you know, or at least imply that Kratom caused what came after. Mm -hmm. Um, That's, that's not rigorous science. And that's gotta be, um, it's gotta be questioned. And I think that's what's happened with Kratom is that because it's something that people are talking about, um, for reasons of regulatory policy and politics, it is now something that is easier to get published on. So if you've got a case study of somebody who uh, it looks like used Kratom and had some kind of result, uh, why not write that up and send it in and see if you can get published? Mm. The problem is that it's just from case study designs, you cannot draw causal conclusions in the way that uh, people want to. And yeah. so we we don't have... We don't have data that say um, kratom will kill you if you take it. Yeah. Uh, it's, there's just none, none that are are that are that rigorous. But you know, can't rule it out either. Yeah. But yeah. it certainly doesn't look that way uh, from uh, in in most people's case. And I mean, the media kind of took that study and ran with it. I I wrote down some of the, uh, I think I wrote down some of the headlines here, but yeah. Kratom supplements are unsafe for use, causes seizures and liver toxicity. Study says Kratom unsafe for treating addiction and pain reveals new research. And this is all on that oh, poison yeah. control center. Herbal supplement used to treat addiction found unsafe by researchers. They took that study and ran with it. Do scientists get frustrated with the media often? Absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, it, it's very, it's very, especially when the FDA is try, is trying to is um. Well, let's see. How should I put this? Um, seems to be complicit in the promotion of data that are weak uh, and all negative, by the way. So uh, when you know, there are a number of us who've done some reasonably high quality science on kratom, and or at least the on kratom users and their experiences is how I would put it, mm-hmm. uh, because you know to distinguish it, it's observational science. It's mm-hmm. distinct from clinical uh, trials, and you know we do take it pretty seriously, and we we do um, interpret it very carefully. And our studies, you're right, they're not uh, they're they're not splashing across the papers, yeah. um, but um, it seems like whether it's because of the FDA or because of the um, the exciting nature uh, of the of the scary findings that some people have got, those yeah. are the studies that have the bullhorn. And um, yeah, it's frustrating. But yeah, we just we just keep um, doing what we're doing and um, and publishing uh, critiques of those studies. 
Yeah. It, it seems like there's a, like a drug horror uh, fiction genre in the news that it, it's kind of a, <laughs> yeah. you, you can plug, you can plug it, you know, you can plug it into the form and get a story from that. Um, oh yeah. For the last, what, 80 years, 90, longer than that even. Um, uh, our, our fear of drugs is used uh, to advance all kinds of political and, uh, and um, policing agendas. Uh, and it works. So they, they keep using it. I mean, does that, how much does that uh, harm people that actually need help with substance abuse? How much does like prohibition and drug fear hurt people that actually need help? Oh, I think it's terribly damaging. I yeah. mean, it's the reason that people go into doctors' offices. It's it's part of the reason that people go into doctors' offices and won't talk about their use of something like kratom. Um, we've you know we've got this idea that uh, there are certain drugs that are bad and will uh, take you down if you uh, take one hit. Um, and that idea has has just it's it's used to incarcerate people, which. Um, you know, it's just one of the many factors that go into the reason that people use drugs in the first place is they don't have jobs. They don't have good lives. They've got early trauma. Uh, they're in poverty. Um, and so by um, coming down so hard legally on uh, people who are using certain substances, uh, we just keep the cycle going. Certain people get paid. Uh, drug users get stigmatized. It's, it's really sad. And we should be doing better at this point because it's been going on for long enough. Um, and there's enough science out there to say it doesn't work. Harm reduction strategies like Kratom do work. Uh, and treating people who use drugs uh, like their people also work. Um, yeah. So I, I hope we'll get there. And I think Kratom's been a nice, uh, a nice way of showing that because – you know, nobody wants to incarcerate somebody's grandma for for treating her pain with a plant that's relatively innocuous. Yeah, um, exactly. And, and yeah, I think yeah. I think so, like the average yeah. age is, or maybe like the mean age is uh, like my age was about forty three. <laughs> I don't. I'm not yeah, sure. If, yeah. yeah, it's, it's not like it's a not young like people so fun people. party drug. <laughs> right. Nobody's running around getting their next fix of kratom to uh, you know. They'd go to a rave or something. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And the one of the Malaysian studies you did, it it um, showed that uh, the people that initiated the use of kratom got uh, out of other risky behaviors, not necessarily because, uh, not necessarily possession of legal drugs. It, it's like uh, other risk behaviors, like prostitution oh, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Why do you think that it's is? Like risk behaviors. Um, you know, that's a good question. We don't we don't know the mechanism from that study in particular. Um, but you know, once you once you uh, and this is just speculation, but once you have stopped using heroin, say, or uh, another drug that you will um, do anything to get, um, you put yourself in fewer risky situations. And so by by cutting down the use of uh, cocaine and heroin, um, Kratom may indeed put people on a better path. There was also another study, and I wasn't on this one, but this was, um, I think this was Darshan Singh uh, out of Malaysia, mm -hmm. uh, who has done, he's done the, he's the lead author on a lot of those studies. Yeah, I see his um, name all the time. Yeah, yeah, he's doing a lot of good work there. And, and um, it, it was interesting. It was uh, a study of um, social functioning among Kratom users. That indicated that, you know, even people who are heavy into Kratom and um, even people who are experiencing withdrawal and such, they're still holding down jobs. They're still um, their, their relationships are OK. Um, now, I can't say that for everybody. Uh, you can go too far with anything. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it says something about the nature of this plant that um, it didn't take over people's lives. Um, they used it and um, continued to function, whereas things like uh, you know, heroin can take over your life and, and bring you down pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. So just keeping people out of risky situations uh, is, is part of harm reduction. And so finding that the more people replace things with Kratom, 
the less they were in risky situations is a is a pretty good finding. Are you uh, working on any kratom studies currently? At this point, no. Uh, we uh, are considering doing a kratom study. We've got a kratom shop here in Rochester uh, that um, the uh, owner of he got off of heroin using kratom. So he's a he's a, yeah. quite an advocate. Uh, we haven't gotten that study off the ground yet. So no, I'm sort of keeping my eye on some things and uh, working on some research with uh, Oliver Grundman and, and some other folks who are doing more active research on Kratom. Is there any, do you know of anything to look for coming up, like uh, any research studies that will be done soon? Um, I'm not sure. There, there are some things uh, under review that yeah. look like they're going to be published, but I don't want to talk about them uh in case they don't get published. Okay. So uh, I do know that there are some people who, who uh, I have run across recently, uh, at least one clinical trial um, on Kratom and pain um, that looked pretty good. Um, it was not, it was a, it was a study out of Malaysia um, using um, some pretty, pretty good methods for assessing pain reduction. Yeah. Uh, so, but um, because those studies haven't passed peer review yet, I don't want to get oh, no, too no. far into that. But that is, you know, that is that is the fight now is to is to um, get more clinical trials done and um, move kratom along in that system so that we can know even more about you know potential subtle adverse events uh, or um, uh, effects that happen when you study um, people more systematically, because mm-hmm. uh, there's always the risk that there are things going on we don't know about, uh, you know, long-term effects of uh, Kratom use that we that we can't get from these studies of uh, Kratom users that we're surveying. Do you think Kratom could possibly be a tool in actual, like, rehabilitation? Would that be yeah. possible? I think so. Uh, you know, the problem is we have a very... Uh, we have a system that has been in place for a long time um, and it includes a process for getting these medications onto the market. And because this isn't something that's a medication, because it's a a largely unregulated plant, it's been a lot more difficult to do research on and a a lot more difficult to get the word out. Um, I think it's already playing a role. I think, you know, since people are already using it, for harm reduction purposes and to get off of uh, opioids, um, it's it's already uh, gotten to that place. And there are a few forward-thinking clinicians who are. Um, there was a program in Maine uh, that was using uh, medical cannabis and kratom for uh, addictions, and so there are those programs that exist. There aren't many of them, um, and there's not a lot of research on how how well they're doing. But I think it's got potential, and that there are enough surveys now that show um, that people are using it for those purposes, whether uh, medical doctors and psychologists are acknowledging it or not. It's it's amazing how people speak about it, like it's you know it changed my life. I get that a lot. And... Oh yeah, I've met those people too, and you know, so I'm always saying, well, you got to be careful about case studies and and yeah. such, um, and that includes the positive ones. The observational research shows that it's not just you and the guy you know or the guy I know. When you look at when you look at people who have used kratom, this is by and large their experience. Not that everybody's had their life turned around, yeah, but that it has made a positive impact. And some people's lives do get changed by this plant. So um, I, I think it's I think that may be in part why it's so uh, controversial is because if it didn't do anything. Um, mm. nobody would be after it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, really. Nobody, nobody uh, yeah. I, I mean, nobody's, uh, think of, think of, uh, maybe salvia or something. Yeah. It's like, uh, has hardcore effect, psychedelic effect, and, uh, no clear medical uses. Nobody, nobody's really going after salvia. Yeah, uh, really. Yeah, it's not it's not about the effect, it's about the utility of it. 
And uh, I think somebody wants a piece of that. It was a privilege talking to Dr. Mark Swagger today. Thank you, Dr. Swagger, for helping the world learn more about Kratom. Uh, Links to many of Dr. Swagger's Kratom studies will be in the description. The music is Risey. The song is called Memories of Thailand. The Kratom Science Podcast is written and produced by me, Brian Gallagher, for KratomScience.com. Take care.